Hello everybody, I'm Dan. Welcome to my Java tutorial series. All the source code for each video tutorial is located on my website at javacjava.com. Throughout my tutorials I will teach you Java using just Notepad and the command prompt. This tutorial is part two of the switch statement. I'm going to go and open up my web browser here to javacjava.com and click on the begin button. Scroll down on my tutorials page till we get to switch statement part two. And this tutorial will build on knowledge gained from the switch statement tutorial part one. In that tutorial, we learned the basic structure for a switch statement. You got your switch and then your expression inside the parentheses, and then your case, and then your constant. And if the expression tests to be the same as the constant, it'll go ahead and execute the statements here. And then you've got your break statement here, your break keyword. And you'll have more case tests. And then if nothing um, evaluates to the same, to equal the same as any of these case constants, it'll go ahead and execute the default with its statements and then break. So now the expression must evaluate to a string, byte, char, short, int, or enum. Don't worry about enum, we haven't talked about that yet. That'll save that for a future tutorial. Okay, so basically up here in the expression, you have to have a string, byte, char, short, or int. Now if you have a like any other data type, like a long or a double or something else like that, right, you're gonna need to do like an if, else if, else statement. It just won't work with the switch. So uh, the case constants must also be of the same data type as the result of the expression. So if this is a string here, this has to be a string. If this is a byte, this has to be a byte. If this is an int, this has to be an int. Yep, pretty straightforward there. So now let's go through the big gotcha and go over that a little bit here. So the switch statement, fall through, and the break. So fall through and the break statement. The switch statement works in a way you might not expect. Each case constant is evaluated top down. The first case constant that equals the result of the expression is the entry point, and all further statements are executed unless the keyword break occurs. Considering this code, consider this code lacking the break statement, right? Um, we've got our, we're initializing a variable a equal to two, it's an int data type, right? So we've got our int a of data type variable a of type int, and then we've got all these ints too as well here, case one, case two, case three, case four, and then our default value. So if it's equal to one, it won't. If it's equal to two, it'll print two, and then print three and four, and so so forth there, right? So we're expecting the result kind of this to kind of just print off two, because that's what we've set this to. But in fact, the result is two, three, four, default is executed also. That's what's displayed to the console might be asking yourself, why? Well, the reason is that since a equals two, the case two colon test evaluated to true and all subsequent statements are executed as well. As far as Java is concerned, none of the remaining case tests even exist anymore. Now, didn't I say the switch statement works in a way you might not expect? Now, that's a rhetorical question, don't, don't really answer that. Um, so basically, case two executed this line, it's like this never existed, this never existed, this never existed. This says, okay, we're going to execute this, we'll execute that, execute this. Okay, we didn't run in any sort of break statement. So, so we just learned the break statement is critical and that it terminates execution of the switch statement at the time it is encountered. Let's make the code above work like we really intended. So we'll go ahead and put in our break statements here, a break there and a break there. So when it comes down here and it evaluates case two, that, that is equals the expression, result of the expression there, it'll go ahead and print um, two to the console and then it'll break, which takes us down to the end here and then program execution would continue on after that. So we get the result is two. Now there are cases where fall through can create some cool programming effects. However, using fall through in your programs can create confusion to other programmers reading your code. The same thing rings true when reading code from other programmers. The switch statement should come with a warning. Beware of the break. The break statement is such an easy thing to overlook, but just keep in mind what it does and more importantly, what happens when it is not there. The example code for this tutorial is gonna take an uppercase letter as a command line argument and display that letter plus all the remaining letters of the alphabet to the console. Let's go ahead and scroll down here and highlight our code. We'll hit Control C to copy or right click and select copy. Let's move our browser off screen here. We're gonna to go to start search, type in CMD. 
That'll open up the command prompt. If you're running Windows 7 or earlier, you can go to start run and type in CMD. First thing you want to do when you're there is type in Java C. You should see a whole bunch of stuff scroll by. If you don't, if you get an error message, go ahead and read my or uh, watch my tutorial on installing the Java development kit. You want to make sure you get that installed and configured properly prior to um, continuing with these tutorials. Let's type in CLS to clear the screen. CD space backslash. CD is short for change directory. Backslash tells it to go to the root. Then we're going to make a directory called Java. Now I already have that folder, but if you didn't, it would go ahead and create it for you. We'll change directories, and now we're going to create a directory called change directories to Java, and we're going to make another subfolder under there called switch2. And we'll go ahead and change to switch2. And we'll do notepad switch2.java. Switch2.java is going to be our source code file. Um, also known as our compilation unit, must end the, in the .java extension. Okay, we'll hit Control v to paste, or you can right-click and select paste. And we'll go ahead and save this here. So, basically we're doing something very similar to the part one tutorial. <clears throat> we're checking to see if um, the parameter args, if its length is not equal to one, we'll go ahead and do invalid number of arguments. And then we'll return. Return will basically terminate the execution of the main method, which will essentially terminate the execution of the whole program. <coughs> and then, um, then basically we're going to do our switch statement here. Now, args, uh, the string array args at index zero, which is element number one, the string array contains a bunch of strings. Right? So this string element is in fact just a regular old string. So all of our case constants have to be strings too as well. Remember these have to match. So if we were to type in something like for example g, right, it would go ahead and print out g. But because we don't have a break statement after g here, right, um, it will go ahead and print out h, i, j, k and all the way through the remaining letters of the alphabet until we hit this break. Because we want it to stop execution before the default down here if a valid letter argument was supplied. So if we type in something like um, one for the argument, right, it's just all, it's not going to hit any of these cases. It's going to go to the default and print out invalid uppercase letter. Java is a case sensitive language. So let's go ahead and run this and play around with it here. Go ahead and compile it. I'm actually going to clear the screen after compiling it here in Java. And then switch to, we'll strip off this, and we won't pass any argument first, invalid number of arguments. That worked up there, and then it went ahead and returned. And then let's go ahead and put in G, for example, right? And you can see it displayed G plus all of the remaining letters of the alphabet there. So exactly what we expected. If we were to type in a lower uh, lowercase g, right? Invalid uppercase letter argument, Java is a case sensitive language. Um, uh, let's see, A, there's everything, Z, there's that, um, let's pick another one, R, bada boom, bada bing. So, everything is working just fantastic, you know, we could put in, um, you know, other arguments, it'll just, we've got a little catch-all on that, so, basically, do M, and it prints off M plus all the remaining characters, uh, letters of the alphabet there. So. I'm going to go ahead and leave this up here just for a moment. I'm going to scroll down here, and I'm going to go over the final thoughts. So I just really want to reiterate a paragraph from above, and that's there are cases where fall-through can create some cool programming effects. However, using fall-through in your programs can create confusion to other programmers reading your code. The same thing rings true when reading code from other programmers. The switch statement should come with a warning. Beware of the break. The break statement is such an easy thing to overlook, but just keep in mind what it does, and more importantly, what happens when it is not there. And now while the, this, you know, the switch statement and the break is all fresh in your mind, it might not be, you know, if you don't look at it for nine months or you come out a year later and you're like, okay, open this up and you look at it and you're like, okay, so if the um, first element of the arg string array is equal to E, we're just going to go ahead and print out E, right? I completely forgot about the break statement, but that's not what the thing is going to do at all. It's going to keep falling through. So... That's just kind of what I wanted to reiterate there is about the break statement and the fall through on the part two of the tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and close that. And that concludes this tutorial. Thanks for watching.